recharged. I hope your break was good. I know my break was good. We're going to cover a few things about the road between here and the end of the semester. Now, you guys know this Friday the stock portfolios are due. And I've got a couple of questions about this. So I want to cover this, uh, this to make you guys feel a little better. I'm going to put this blind out. However, it's so bright in here. you got to get some more, uh, more shade in here. Guys, if you will recall, uh, when we got into the stock game, I provided everybody with a copy of an A-grade paper. For this project, guys, if you haven't been looking at your portfolios every day, that's okay. Because you're using some kind of aggregator to track your stocks. Who here has at least looked in on their stocks in the last week? All right, very good. Guys, I want to summarize this so you know what you're doing. You guys all still have copies of that paper. I'm going to tell you the secrets to getting a good grade on this paper. Your first secret, please split up the work. I know group projects. Why does everybody hate group projects? Because there's always that one person who seems to become invisible any time there's work to be done. And there's always going to be somebody who's a free rider. I mean, let's, let's be honest here. Has anybody ever been in a group project where everybody did an equal amount of the work? If you have, you're lucky. Hardly ever happens. So we do this. People say, well, why do you do group projects? Life's a group project, and it's a, it's a learning experience because even in the real world, you're going to deal with this stuff too. But here's the ways you can guarantee you're going to get a good grade on this paper. Do you have to make money on your portfolio? No, you do not. If you lose your ass in this thing, if you literally make three or four completely terrible investments and lose all your money, you can still get an A on this project. Here's the ways people screw up. Number one, cite your sources. Whenever you're giving me a background of your company, you're telling me how they're doing in the market, in parentheses, tell me where you got the information. You need to have at least one uh, reference for each company about the background and at least one reference from a news article. So if you've got three stocks you're following, that means you need at least six sources. Second thing, plagiarism. And people, most of the time when they plagiarize, don't even realize they've done it. If you use a direct quote from somebody, what do you have to have around? You've got to have quotation marks and you got to have a citation. So many people make the mistake of saying, I'll put that in later and they forget about it. Third way that people lose points is by not checking their math. Remember, we, we have this whole rate of return. You've got to do the individual rate of return for each stock that you have. And you've got to do your whole portfolio's rate of return. So I can see how much money you made or lost on a number and percentage basis. If you look at the charts in that sample paper I gave you, most of those you can download right off of Yahoo Finance or whatever uh, source you're using for your stock points. And it, at the end of it, guys, I need a little analysis. You guys need to tell me what worked, what didn't. In other words, if your team had a really hard time getting together or you disagreed or whatever, tell me what didn't work, tell me what did work. If you guys worked really well together and you think you did a great job, tell me that, guys. That is the essence of how you get a good grade on this paper. Now, they're due Friday at midnight. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Tomorrow is probably the last day you're going to be able to reliably get feedback from me. So if there's something you want me to take a look at, I'm going to be here most of the day tomorrow. I don't teach on Thursday, so I'll be in my office. If you want me to take a look at something, to say, hey, Tonkin, is this plagiarism? Can you help me look at my math? I will gladly do that for you. If you come in on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock when I'm walking out the door, that's not a good time to ask me for feedback. Now, here's the other trick, too, guys. The official deadline for this is Friday at midnight. I'm giving you this option. If you work through the weekend, as so long as it is in my inbox, by the, or in the submission box inside Canvas, by the time I start grading on Monday or Tuesday, actually on Monday, then you, you're going to be fine. So the deadline, the official deadline is Friday. I set it up this way so that you've got the weekend to get, get it together because we're coming back off a short week. So the only other thing I will tell you guys, I have it set up in Canvas because you guys are in groups. One member of your group will submit the assignment. The grade will show up in all of your grade boxes. What questions do you have? Yes, sir. What is the uh, rate of return? What Take it out to four decimals, then round it. So, you know, make, make sure you get as much of a rate of return as possible. I will tell you this. If you, let's say, for example, Stefan, you made a mistake and you took it to two or three decimals. I might ding you a couple of points, but that's not going to cost you a letter grade. But four decimals is where you take it before you round. Great question. Other questions? I'll be around all day tomorrow, guys. If you have questions, hit me up. We have a couple other things to, to talk about before we dive in for today, guys. And you're actually going to be 
voting on when we're taking our next test. We're going to be making a collective decision. Guys, this week I'll be asking for the folks in Career Services to send me a list of everybody's handshake uh, pages so I can give everybody 10 easy credits for that, 10 easy points I should say. The discussion post, what franchise would you start, is overdue. If you get, got a zero on that, I'm giving you until tonight to give you some kind of a post on that so I can give you credit for it. Guys, our next test in this class is going to be test number two. It's going to look just like test number one, except it's four chapters instead of three. It's going to be on chapters 16, 4, 5, and 6. All right, we will review for it. You will have a study guide. We're going to talk about the schedule of this next test shortly. Our final exam, however, is not something I have any leeway on. Our final exam, yes, you get a Saturday 8 a.m. final. The 1st of May, we will be coming back to this room 8 a.m., to 10 a.m. to take the final. Is the final in this class cumulative? It is not. Whatever we cover after the second test in here is what will be on the final exam and we will review. This, in, in all honesty, the final in this class is probably the easiest test within the class because it's the shortest. There will be bonus points. It's weighed equally with the other tests and that means if you screwed up on test one or two, here's your chance to have a, a chance at saving your grade and getting it where you want it to be. That being said, guys, Test two. I, I anticipate we're going to be finishing this chapter today or Friday. I'm giving you two options. We can either take the test on Monday, which means you're doing that at the same time you're working on your stock portfolios, or we can do it on Wednesday. As soon as we get done with this chapter, I'll be sending out the study guide. So when you finish today, you'll have the study guide today. But I would like you to vote. Are we doing the test on Monday or Wednesday? It makes no difference to me. I have a feeling it's going to be a very lopsided vote. All right, we'll give it just a minute for everybody to get, get their votes in. But it looks like our test is going to be next Wednesday. Now, here's the deal, guys. As soon as we get done with chapter 6, I'll send you out the study guide. You'll have it the whole time to study. Our test is going to be on Wednesday the 14th. So that's next Wednesday. It's going to be our second test in here. This is your biggest test in this class. It's not any more difficult than the first one. There will be bonus questions on the exam. Any questions, guys? All right, any questions on the stock game or, or our path to the end of the semester? Okay. Well, guys, let's jump in then. We left off, guys, talking about management and talking about the different activities. I'm sorry that it's a little hard to read in here. In fact, I'm just going to shut these lights completely off. It's so bright in here. As the old song goes, the future's so bright, i got to wear a shade. Management has four components to it, four primary components. Planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. When you plan, it means you're looking toward the future. If we're planning one to five years out, what kind of planning is that called? It begins with an S. Strategic, very good. And when you're organizing, it means you're combining jobs properly. You're putting them in the right order. What restaurant did I make reference to in terms of how you can organize a job? I'll give you a hint. Dry came up. We made him a we made him a sandwich. It was Subway. Absolutely, that's an example of how we organize jobs. Leading means how do you motivate people? How do you inspire them? We have different kinds of leadership styles, and then we get into the next section we're going to be talking about which is controlling. It means we're controlling and managing how the work gets done. It means you've got to evaluate people to see are they measuring up to the standards you've set. If somebody is not doing well, are we giving them an opportunity to approve? Are we giving them advice on how to approve? This is where we get into the management side. Leadership and management are not the same thing, but management and le leaders can be the same person. So let's get into controlling, guys. This means that we're basically looking at, okay, we know we set our strategy. We know we have these big, hairy, audacious goals, as Dr. Spry likes to say. Are we reaching? How do we determine if we've reached our goals? Let me ask you guys. If you wanted to determine whether or not you did well in a class, how could you determine that? Your grade. Your grade. You got an assessment. Well, we do the same thing for people. We call it performance management. We have to determine if people are doing a good job, not just for themselves, but for the company. Are you accomplishing the goals that we have set forth for you? And we also have to look at the plan we've set out. Let's say, for example, we're Ford Motor Company. I asked this question before, but I really would love it if somebody would refresh my memory. What's different about an F-150 in 2021 
than an F-150 in 1972. What's different? They're both big trucks, but what's different? What's something you might see on the dashboard of a truck that you wouldn't have seen in 1972 that you would see in, that, in 2021? Technology. Technology, exactly right. So if we're, if we're Bill Ford, or we're, we're the CEO of Ford, and it's 1990, and we're saying by the end of the 21st century, the beginning of the 21st century, we want to be the most high-tech truck company in the world, we've got to redo how we're making our trucks. If we're redoing how we're making our trucks, we've got to hire different people. We also have to look back and see, are we hitting the goals that we set forth for ourselves? So it means how are we going to make sure the plan is being implemented? We also can call, can call this project management in smaller kinds of instances. So what do we do when we're controlling? We set the goals. If we're a coach, we say we want to be undefeated and we want to win six out of ten, six out of ten games. We measure performance. How does a coach measure performance? I got some coaches in here who are football players. What do your coaches do? Jake, well, how does your coach tell if you're performing well? Um, doing lifting tests. Lifting tests? What else might he watch? Yeah. He's going to watch your film. Absolutely. So we're looking at how we can measure performance. If you're working at Subway, how many subs are you making an hour? If you work at a factory, how many pieces are you putting out per hour? We've got to measure that performance. Then we're going to compare it to the standards. Oh, Tonkin up here is slapping. He should be making six subs every 30 minutes, and he's making four. Could that be a problem with his motivation? Could be a problem with the way the work is actually set up? Or could be the fact that he needs additional training? Corrective action means we're going to fix the problem. We're going to give additional training. We're going to fix the workstation. Maybe we're going to send him to some motivational training. And then we're going to use that information to set the standard. You guys remember, for example, I, I talked about what the difference was. I think it was, uh, it was Stefan. I think we, we made a sandwich in your kitchen, didn't we? Yes. Stefan's kitchen is laid out different than Subway. Let's say, for example, Subway, we determined that the reason that the subs are not getting made very quickly is because there's obstacles in the way. Well, that means we need to change this. Or maybe we're determining that if we have somebody making 12 subs an hour, the subs are terrible, they're sloppy. Maybe our performance goals are too high. This whole process is cyclical. That's the point to take away from it. So when you're in this kind of situation, if you're a manager, you've got different roles. You've got an information role, you've got an interpersonal role, and you've got a decision-making role. An information role means I'm telling you guys this information. I'm, I'm in the information role right now. I'm talking to you guys about the information. When I get to the interpersonal role, I'd be like, hey, how are you doing today? Doing all right? All right, you enjoying yourself today, sir? Can I, can I top off a drink? Excellent, excellent. That's the interpersonal role, checking to make sure you guys are happy. The decision-making role. I made a decision based on your feedback that we are going to be doing the test next Wednesday instead of Monday to give you guys more time to work on your stock portfolio. These are ways that we make decisions when we are managers. So what about the information role? The information role, you're going to be monitoring, for example, how things are getting done. Are people doing well in the factory? Are things working well? Are the parts working well? Are people in this school of business performing well? We're going to disseminate information, meaning, hey, we've had a change in how we're going to be doing our standardized testing for the school of business comprehensive exam. So we need to talk to our teachers about that. The spokesperson, the, have, who has ever heard the expression, the buck stops here? Raise your hand if you've heard that expression. Really? One person? You're the only person who's heard this expression. Well, what does it mean? <coughs> How it's goofing around, the, the shenanigans stop here. Like, you know. I love that word shenanigans. If somebody says they're up to shenanigans, it sounds like there's going to be like monkeys or clowns jumping out of a butt with shenanigans. I, I like the other, the other word I like is tomfoolery. Anybody ever heard that word tomfoolery? Yeah, we're having enough of these tomfoolery and hijinks. But when the buck stops here, what that means is somebody is taking ownership. I'm taking ownership of this problem. I'm the spokesperson for the organization. So the spokesperson role that a manager does is basically being the face of the organization. When we had to go online last March, the message did not come from a janitor. The message did not come from a teacher. The message came from the president of the university. This is what we got to do, guys. We got to keep everybody safe. So that's the spokesperson role who is going to also take the credit and the blame. So other things, guys, people who do these things, a figurehead 
It means somebody represents the company symbolically. When I say Apple, who is the very first person you guys think of? Steve Jobs, absolutely. All right, how many of you guys are Steelers fans? When I say Steelers, what's the first word that comes to mind? Who's the first person that comes to mind? Oh, come on, who speaks for the Steelers? Ben he's, he's definitely, that's arguable too. Ben, I'm thinking one other person though. I'm thinking Mike Tomlin. So he, he serves as the image for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's a man who leads with integrity. Leaders are people, again, we talk about the difference between leaders and managers. These are people who cause us to aspire to things. Then the liaison is somebody who helps people talk to each other. All of those are interpersonal roles. A decision role means you're the person who encourages people to do things that are entrepreneurial in spirit. When we think of leaders who are entrepreneurial, somebody who's creative, there's one person who jumps to my mind all the time these days because we talked about him a lot. Who am I thinking about? Who has an entrepreneurial spirit and a vision for his company? Who am I thinking about? Elon Musk, absolutely correct. And the person in a decision-making role also decides who's getting raises, who, how the work is being evaluated, and also if, if there's problems. If there's friction between people, you got to be the person who dis discerns who's right and who's wrong. And you also play the role of negotiator. We're going to keep going because we're, uh, we're going to try to wrap up this chapter today. But when you're making decisions as a leader or a manager, some are easy, some aren't so easy. When I say easy, doesn't mean simple. For example, if somebody is doing poorly in the company, we hire them to do a job, but repeatedly they fail. Every time we tell them what they're doing wrong, it goes in one ear and out the other. Eventually, what do we have to do with that person potentially? We gotta let them go. That's a simple program decision. It's not it's not simple to do, believe me. Anybody in this room ever had to fire somebody, by the way? It is the most miserable experience of your life to have somebody basically who you know they deserve it. You know that they're a terrible employee. You know they've been given plenty of opportunities to improve, but you still think to yourself, wow, I'm talking about this person. Didn't tell them. It's a terrible place to be. It's not fun, but it's a program decision. A non program decision means you've got to make a decision and make something happen based on unforeseen circumstances. Who here can tell me? What has been an unforeseen circumstance? We get a good response to this part of the room. I need this part of the room to speak up today. Guys, what is an example of a circumstance that nobody in business could have possibly comprehended that everybody had to respond to? COVID. Very good. Very good. Still from the front of the room, but that's okay because you guys are on. COVID-19. We had to improvise. We had to come up with new ways of doing things because it was a non-programmed decision. It was tough. This is the steps in the decision-making process. Whether you are a leader or a manager, probably more often a manager, the first is you define what is the actual problem we're trying to solve. If you can't articulate what's wrong, how can you fix it? Well, then we're going to test what are ways we can fix the problem. Well, our problem is we got COVID-19. We can't have people in our restaurant anymore. So what can we do? Well, let's see what the possible solutions are. We could do curbside pickup. We could convert to a ghost restaurant. We could emphasize delivery more often. Those are all possible solutions. And then we're going to select which ones we're going to do. Well, we don't have enough delivery drivers, so we're going to do curbside pickup. That's select one more alternatives. Once we decide what we're going to do, we're going to roll this out. We're going to train everybody on how we are going to operate. Well, from now on, it's going to be curbside pickup only. And follow it. We're going to follow up to see if the problem has been solved. Are we making money? Are we, get, we hitting our numbers? Are we still making a profit? This is the basic decision-making process that all managers have to, at some point, go through. So it comes down to defining the problem. Guys, uh, before we continue, because we are at about 23 after right now, and we have a very quiet room today, it's time for our first question or comment of the day. And I'm going I'm to take a stroll around the room, and I'm going to randomly stop in front of somebody, and they can either ask a question or make a comment. Who is it going to be today? I don't know. Let's see what kind of weird I'm in. Hey, who is it going to be? Oh, I think, I think I'm zooming in on Joe. Joe, what, what would you like to say or ask today? Uh, what is something that you're looking forward to this summer? What I'm looking forward to this summer is living in t-shirts, cargo shorts, and not wearing shoes. Living in flip-flops for four months and letting my beard grow. That's what I'm looking forward to. What are you looking forward to? Um, I guess it's the beach. 
be, be done with school for the summer. Amen, brother. I, that's a that's a church I can go to all summer long. Guys, in terms of, of managerial skills, what are skills managers need? Well, I, let me ask you guys. We're going to go down one row at a time. What's a skill that, that managers need? If you're going to be an effective manager. Anybody in this row, what's a skill that a manager might need? Patience. Patience. I love it. What's a skill that a manager might need? Knowledge, for sure. What's a skill that a manager might need? Confidence. What's a skill that a manager might need? Charisma. What's a skill that a manager might need? Problem solving. What's a skill a manager might need? I'm sorry? So good there, yeah, sorry. Creativity. Absolutely. Yes. So guys, the, the closer you are to the ground, the more fundamental your skills are. If you're managing a restaurant, for example, if you're managing McDonald's, you got to know how to make hamburgers and french fries. If you are managing Ford Motor Company at an executive level, you got to be more creative. So the higher you go up, there's fewer people, and they have to have bigger ideas. So how does this work, guys? If you're top management, you got to be able to think big, and you've got to have good human skills as well. Think about this, for example, if you're Elon Musk, you're thinking of the next big thing conceptually, but you're also thinking of how do we communicate my vision, because I'm crazy smart through other people, and how do I get other people on this train with me? Then we get to middle management. Middle management isn't setting strategy as much, but they need human skills more than anything because they're translating between here and here. What rolls downhill, guys? What's that? Blame. Blame rolls downhill. What else rolls downhill? Oh, you can say it. We're adults here. Oh, for God's sakes. What am I saying? Say it after me. Shit. Say it one more time. Shit. Shit. I want you to repeat after me. Shit rolls downhill. Shit rolls downhill. See, didn't that feel good? Guys, shit rolls downhill. And so if you're in middle management, you're catching it from this way, and it bubbles up from the bottom too. So you've got people in the middle who have to manage that stuff. And then you've got supervisors, the people who are making sure people are flipping burgers. They've got to get things done through people, but it's more important that they have technical skills. That's why they're right here. See, it's okay to swear once in a while. It feels a little dirty when you do it in the classroom, but it's okay. You guys, you guys won't tell if I don't. You won't tell anywhere. Excellent. Thank you. All right, guys. In terms of uh, management skills, we talked about what skills management needs. Write this down or make it note of it in your head. KSA. Anybody know what that means? I'll give you a hint. The first one is knowledge. What might the S and the A stand for? It's not shit. Knowledge, blank and blank. Anybody? Skills? Oh, we got knowledge, skills. What the? What might be the A? Any guesses? What might be a, a positive attribute that begins with A? Or a word that begins with A? It's abilities. Knowledge, skills, and abilities. So what kind of, of knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSAs, write that down, do managers need to have? Again, we need to be able to have human relations skills. We need to be able to understand people. We need, need to be able to understand their motivation. Different things motivate different people. And then you need conceptual skills. I promise not to call on you, but I want you to move your arms. Have you ever heard of this term, the 30,000-foot view? Who has ever heard that term? Let's, I'll put it in perspective with you. Let's say we flew up. You've all seen pictures of satellites looking at the Earth. Are there things that we can only see when we're high off the ground? Yeah, of course there are. Greg, what might be something we can only see when we're high off the ground? Um, mountains. Big mountain ranges. The Rockies. Anybody ever flown over the Rockies? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got mountain ranges. Who here has ever heard of the Nausicaa Lines in Peru? Seriously, you guys have never heard of the Nausicaa Lines? Check this out, guys. In Peru, you, I'm giving you permission. Look this up. There are lines on the ground that make giant pictures that you can only see from hundreds of feet in the air, and these predate airplanes. Who the heck were these folks talking about? If you are able to look at the big picture, you have the 30,000 foot view. If you get the 30,000 foot view, you've got the conceptual skills. Think about it this way. If you are watching a football game from the stand versus being in the action on the field, is it a different view? Yeah, you might see things from up high you can't see from on the ground. The guy or girl who is a good manager, who has conceptual skills, can see the whole field of play from the 30,000 foot view. And then we get into what we refer to as crisis management. Guys, again, unforeseen events. 
Sometimes things blow up. Sometimes all your best plans go away. And you've got to figure out a way to be able to counter it. Our most recent bout with this was COVID-19. However, I hear people complaining about gas. And gas, the price of gas is going up. And it is going up. But check this out, guys. Here's an example of crisis management at its finest. In the early 1970s, OPEC. Has anybody ever heard of OPEC? What's, what's OPEC, you know? They're, they're, an oil, they're an oil producing cartel. So basically, most of the countries in the world that produce oil, the United States is not a member of OPEC. But a lot of countries that produce oil are members of basically a cartel. They set pricing and production. In the early 1970s, in the United States, all of a sudden, our oil supply was drying up. We did not have large producers of petroleum in the United States. We got almost all of our petroleum from the Middle East. And the Middle East turned off the clock. If you've ever seen a picture of most cars from the 1970s, they don't look like Pintos. They look more like land yachts. In fact, I'm going to show you what the average car looked like. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going to show you what the average car looked like in 1973. Let's, let's do a 1973 Ford LTD. And let's see. Yeah, look at this beauty. This is a coupe, guys. This car is about 14 or 15 feet long. Can anybody guess what kind of gas mileage do these cars get? If you were lucky. Look at the size of this thing. You get the, you, the, Grim, the Griswold station wagon version. So what happened to American manufacturers all of a sudden when people were running out of gas? They were left with no small cars to sell and a crisis. Does anybody remember? We talked about a car that came out of this era. What was that car's name? The one that doesn't blow up when you hit? The Ford Pinto was the answer to this problem. This is how bad it was, guys, in the United States in the 1970s. You were allowed to get gas every other day. Literally. I would write this down because this could show up. I would write this down. I would write this down because this could show up as a bonus question. Every other day in the United States, you could get gas. And it depended if your license plate had an odd or an even number. That's how bad the gas crisis got, and prices went through the roof. That's what happens when you have not planned for that kind of a scenario. So guys, that's what crisis management is all about, and it's where we, we get, separate good from bad leaders. So what do we learn from this stuff? What do we learn is we got to make sure that we are preparing for the next crisis. We prepare for the next crisis based on the lessons learned from the last crisis. In reality, have we learned a lot of lessons about gas? I don't know. In 1918, Ford Model T got 22 miles to the gallon, the first mass production automobile in the history of the United States. Anybody guess, for example, what the average fuel economy is in the United States for a car at this point in time? Take a guess. We got a guess for 18. It's actually a little higher. It's 22. It's exactly what the 1918 Ford Model T was. So in 103 years of the mass production automobile, we're getting the same gas mileage as when we started. So we have not learned a lot of those lessons. Although, who here, who here knows about a company that just made a big a, a, a announcement about electric cars? It wasn't Tesla. Who was it? GM. They're saying what? By, by 2030, they're going to be all electric. Do you think it's going to happen? I don't know. They said the Hummer. It's not going to be cheap either. That's going to be a crazy vehicle. But yeah, we've got the Hummers coming out, being reborn as an electric vehicle. I think it's going to be interesting to see if people will, will buy onto this. Actually, I, I want you guys to have an opinion on this. Because because it's so quiet here today, right? If we gave you the option of an electric vehicle instead of buying a gas vehicle for the same price that you get a gas-powered vehicle, how many of you would be ready to try an electric? How many of you would not? How many of you have not raised your hand? Because you don't know. It's okay not to know. Somebody who would be willing, will you tell me what? Yes. Uh, I think they're really cool. I mean, I think the possibilities are endless. So they're cool. Somebody who says, no, I don't want an electric car, why would you say no? Yes. Uh, I think, well, like, at least around here.
other thing too, charging stations. I mean, if you go to sheets, a lot of those have them now, but it can be very unreliable. Here's my prediction, and I've been wrong before, I'll be wrong again. I think that the major gas companies are not really opposing electric cars because, in reality, who already has a distribution network for setting up these stations? The gas companies. They own convenience stores. Sheets already is located next to every major highway in this part of Pennsylvania, so it makes sense. You're going to put charging stations. If you are BP, if you're British Petroleum, and you own a bunch of gas stations, well, what's the big deal? We'll put in some charging stations. We're still going to be making money off of automobiles. So I think that is definitely something that's going to continue to happen. So we also are seeing a big transition. Speaking of technology, is the idea that we are using tech to change the way we work. Guys, I predict something that's not going to go back to normal ever after the pandemic. Here's what I predict. I predict that some of us, you guys, some of you guys, may never work in a traditional office environment ever. I think with the idea of doing online Fridays or hybrid work or work from home all of a sudden isn't such a high-tech idea anymore because we've proved it works. Here's what the challenges are, though, guys. Actually, let me ask you guys, what might be a challenge for a manager? Let's say, for example, that tomorrow, Father Malachi came in and said, all of a sudden, all your students are going to be going online, but you want, I want you to teach classes and do the same things you're doing. What might be challenging? What might be my biggest challenge? Yes? Connecting with folks on a personal level. Exactly right. And, and seeing if you're engaged. See, like today, man, if I were, if I were going on the engagement score, I'm failing today. You guys, you guys are having a rough day today. In fact, stand up for a second. I'm serious. Stand up. Stand up. I want you to just stretch, move your arms. I don't care if you want to shake your leg. I might shake my leg a little bit, my bones. Crack whenever I go, you maybe you want to do some fun dance moves, whatever. Move a little bit, shake your hands out. I want to see some enthusiasm in here, guys. It's a short week this week, and I guys, it's a short week, and I just gave you an extension on your biggest assignment. Isn't that worth something, right? There should be some enthusiasm there. You, how many of you, by show of hands, are getting a cumulative final in at least one of the class? All right, that's a reason for celebrating. How many of you have just had your teacher yesterday say, hey, your final is going to be the easiest exam you're going to take in the entire semester. Yeah, other, other than me, probably nobody. It's a reason to be excited, right? It's a reason to feel good. There's not so much wrong in the world, and let's get energized for the rest of the day. We've got three weeks to get through it together. So guys, see, I like it. Just moving around here, getting some energy. I like even going through and doing some hand dance moves, but I don't move at all. I just want you to get moving today. Now you can have a seat again. Let's try this question again. What might be a challenge for a manager? What might be a challenge for a manager trying to remotely manage people? What might be a challenge? Yes? You never really know what they're doing. Exactly right. Because after all, what is management? Management means getting things done for other people, and we tend to do it by walking around. How do I tell if people are engaged? I walk around and see if they're, if they're in, if they look like they're falling asleep. I can look at them. I can see them. It's harder to engage people at a distance. And what that means as managers, we also have to come up with different ways of measuring performance. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter what I see in the person. It matters what I see in the output. And the way we're transforming our crisis management is the next time we have a pandemic, and God forbid there is going to be a next time, I'm sure of it, we definitely will be using lessons learned from this crisis to control the way we work. We also get into this challenge now, guys, where we've got multiple cultures working, guys. What's challenging about the multicultural work environment? What's one thing that's challenging? Yes? Definitely. We have language barriers. We have language and cultural barriers. What's another challenge? Yes? Definitely. Excellent point, guys. When we think about it, in the United States, it's not just St. Francis, but most companies, when are our big breaks? We well, usually between Christmas and New Year's because we tend to operate on Christian scheduled holidays. Does anybody know in the United States, what are the two, or actually in the world, what are the two quickest growing religions? Yep. Islam is one. What's the other? It's an absence of religion, atheism. 
two quickest growing religions or belief systems are Islam and atheism. So all of a sudden, you got, it doesn't mean they're the dominant ones. I mean, right now there's more Christians than just about anybody in the world. But it means that we might need to think about flexible leave policies. It means if we've got somebody, for example, who practices Islam, they might need a place to pray several times a day. We may need to offer options in the dining hall that are vegetarian. Many people from India are vegetarian. And sometimes between cultures, things get screwed up, guys. We make mistakes. I'll give you a great example here. I used to work for a, a, a guy who was, was Jewish. And here, they, at the company I was working at, they tried very much to be inclusive, to make sure that they were giving options so everybody could eat. So while well, the rest of us were having cheeseburgers, because he was Jewish, he couldn't eat cheese and meat. That was against his dietary restrictions. They gave him a shrimp salad, thinking that would make up for it without realizing that many people who practice Judaism, shrimp is considered to be unclean. So even in our best attempts to do the right things, sometimes we still screw up, and that's because we are learning this stuff as we go. Well, we look at that. We finished chapter 6 today. What that means, guys, is we're going to do a brief review of chapter 6. Then I'm going to let you go, and we're going to start our next chapter on Friday, knowing that you guys will be taking the test on chapters 16, 4, 5, and 6 next Wednesday. So let's get into the review, shall we? Yeah, what a great idea. All right, the process of building, or I'm sorry, the process of guiding the development, maintenance, and allocation of resources to attain organizational goals is that human resource management, personnel management, industrial relations, or management. What do you think? We got a guess from management, it's correct. All right, I said it just a minute ago. How did, how did I define management? What is my personal definition of management? Yes. Ding, 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 correct. You got the bonus round. Getting things done through other people. The managerial process includes all of the following except what? Is it anticipating potential problems, coordinating resources, making people happy, or reviewing results and making changes, which is not part of the process. Although we hope that we can make people happy, it's not an official part of the process. True or false? Efficiency and effectiveness are the same thing. That is false. All right, who can tell me what the difference is? What's the difference between efficiency and effectiveness? Keep going, you're, you're there. I would, I would accept your definition. And here, here's what I'll give you as an analogy. Efficiency versus effectiveness. All right, who's going who's gonna to help me? Let's see. I'm not going to call them. Grace, you come up here for a second. All right, here's the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. What's your favorite car? You can have any car you want. What would it be? Let's say you got a Dodge Charger, okay? You got a Dodge Charger. Actually, stand face to face this group with me. You got a Dodge Charger, and I got a Chevy Cavalier. But right now, the light just turned from red to green. We're going to go to the back of the room. So let's walk. You're going to walk way faster than me. Oh, look at that. We crossed the finish line. We both got across the finish line. Thank you for doing that for me, by the way. Grace got there more quickly than I did. Hers was more effective. But her Dodge Challenger was getting about 10 miles to the gallon. My Chevy Cavalier was getting third. So I'm more efficient, but we're both effective. So you can be effective and not efficient. It's like the idea of trying to hit a fly with a bowling ball. It's effective, but it's not efficient. All right, the four primary activities of managers include all of the following except what? Is it planning, concluding, leading, or controlling, which is not one of the four activities? Concluding. Very good. I love it. What kind of strategy, yeah, I just gave you the answer. What kind of planning is one to five years out? Of course it's strategic. All right, what does SWAT stand for? Boom, well done. All right, how far out do tactical plans go? Is it less than a year, one to two years, three to five years, or longer than five years? Because we talked about what strategic is. What's tactical? You've got it. We're thinking strategy, we're talking about how to take over all of Europe. That is our strategy, our tactical is when we're landing troops on the ground, to use a military analogy. Oh, okay, I reveal my age in class right before break. How old am I? Oh, very good. I feel every bit of it some days. 
If a manager is doing planning for his normal daily businesses, they are engaged in what kind of plan? Is it strategic, tactical, contingency, or operational? Say it real loud. Operational is correct. True or false, a statement of what a company is all about is their mission statement. That is true. Which of the following is not part of the organizational management function? Is it a combination of tasks, dividing up tasks, grouping jobs and employees, or assigning authority and responsibilities? Which is not part of organizational management? Take a guess. We got yes, Ray, and it's correct. All right. This type of managers, what type of managers are in the C-suite? Are they supervisory, middle, upper middle, or top? CEO, CIO, CFO. I'd say top for sure. What makes middle managers so important? Who can tell me that? They can speak both languages. They can speak strategic. They can speak tactical. And what rolls downhill? Sure. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. True or false? Great managers are always great leaders. That is false. They can be, but they're not always. And why is that? Who can tell me why a great manager is not always a great leader? What do you think? Why might a great manager not be a great Exactly right. And there are people, for example, who are really good at doing accounting. There are people who are really good at seeing where the money is going, but they're not good at being visionary sometimes. So sometimes great managers don't make great leaders. Bless you. People listen to Professor Smarty Pants because of his title. What kind of power is he using? Is it legitimate, expert, referent, or coercive? We have, we have, say that real loud. It's actually legitimate. It's based on a title. Jim is a manager who is always threatening to fire people they don't shape up. What kind of power is he wielding? Coercive. It is coercive. Yeah. And does that work in the long run? No, not in the long term. Sally always likes her employees to be a part of the, her decision-making process. What kind of leadership style does she have? Is it autocratic, participative, free reign, or person-centric? It is big. If she was making all the decisions, it would be autocratic. True or false, free reign leadership is also known as laissez-faire. It is true. Oh, oui, oui. All right. What company did I describe as empowering their employees? There's a company I love. I talk about them all the time. I might even stop there almost every day. Sheets. Yeah, they empower their employees. All right, true or false? Corporate culture emerges quickly. Give you a hint, St. Francis has been around since 1847. It is false. It takes time. The process of assessing organizational progress toward goals is that planning, concluding, leading, or controlling. It is not concluding. It is controlling. So just like that X you had, you tried to run your life, this is control. True or false, the first step in the control process is setting performance standards and goals. That is true. A manager who's helping resolve disputes is acting in what role? Informational, decisional, interpersonal, or entrepreneur? You know, you could argue that, or you could argue decisional. I, our text says decisional, but if you said interpersonal, I'd still give you credit for that, because I think that's interpersonal, too. COVID-19 disrupted many normal operations at most places of business. As a, as a result, Many managers had to make what kind of decisions? Programmed, non-programmed, life or death or simple? Non-programmed. We had to improvise. All the following are part of the managerial decision-making process except what? Define problem, evaluate problem, identify possible solutions, or select one or more alternatives, which is, which is not part of the decision-making process. It is B. So that's a semantics issue. Which, which level of management is most likely to need conceptual skills? Top, middle, supervisory, or line? If you want to see a 30,000 foot view, where do you got to stand? You got to stand at the top. True or false, human relations skills are key to understanding interrelations of all parts of the company. 
I would say that is conceptual skills. And that's it, guys. That's it for Pitt, and that ain't no shit. I said it. You can't possibly say that word too many times, guys. Have a wonderful day.